Today's video, I'm going to talk about who I feel are the four horsemen of the wrestling apocalypse. And what I mean by this are the four people that most negatively impacted the business of professional wrestling. And, you know, this is a very subjective thing. This is just one outside fan's personal opinion. A lot of people inside of the business and people outside of the business may agree or disagree with some of the things that I say here. But, you know, it's one of these things where it's funny with some of the names I'm going to talk about. They also were responsible for some very big periods in the history of professional wrestling. But with some of the things that were sacrificed for those big periods, they helped usher in some uh, catastrophic negative changes. The first person I'm going to talk about, though, is Eddie Mansfield. And a lot of you may not be 100% familiar with who he is. Some of you may be a little bit familiar with who he is. But the bottom line is, is if you've ever seen the highlights of the 2020 special done by John Stossel back in the early 80s, I believe it was like 1984. That's where the infamous incident where Dr. David David Schultz slapped John Stossel and said, how fake is that? Does that hurt? <laughs> he slapped the taste out of John Stossel's face. <laughs> and you know what? To this day, screw John Stossel. He still views that as what helped make his career. It's kind of a pathetic thing if you ask me. However, during that whole documentary piece about the inside workings of professional wrestling where you see uh, 30 years ago Vince McMahon talking about the business and they illustrate some of the wrestlers, interview some of them. Um, you know, the big thing where Hulk Hogan's walking down uh, Times Square with John Stossel and the people are just flocking Hogan all over the place. Um, you know, it was Eddie Mansfield who contributed to that piece that exposed a lot of the inner workings of how a match is put together and how it's fake or scripted, let's say. Um, he really blew the doors off of the place. Now, it had happened about 50 years before that back in New York with the Jilted Promoter. Yes, true. And people always had their suspicions about it being a work and being scripted and not believing it being real. But a lot of people ignored that and were able to suspend their disbelief and get so caught up into it that if it wasn't constantly a reminder in their face, they were going to overlook it and pretend that it was real. They were going to pretend that it was real. And I think that's sometimes what a lot of kids do when we watch professional wrestling. I did it as a kid. We knew deep down it was not real, but we pretended that it was real. It allowed us to imagine and allowed us to suspend disbelief. But Eddie Mansfield was the one that sat there and said, no, this is a work. He talked about homosexuality in the business. He talked about sleeping his way to the top if that's what he had to do. You know, he wasn't going to do that, but the possibility was there, and that was the only way he was ever going to get on top. He talked about how some of the other inner workings of the business worked in terms of promoters and other wrestlers and demonstrated how some of the moves were pulled off and how the great art of the scripted pro wrestling match, you know, was all fake. And, you know, even though that was back during the 80s and you could say, well, shit, that was at the beginning of the Hogan era and wrestling exploded and had another great boom period in the 90s. Yes, but you could also point to that as a seminal moment, even before anything else, where you could sit there and say that's when the wool started to be pulled away from the people's eyes and people started to see the professional wrestling business for what it was, and that's when the professional wrestling business started getting on the defensive instead of being on the offensive and saying we're no different than any other form of entertainment, da, 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 da. I understand the philosophy and the perspective that Mansfield was coming from back in the early 80s. I get that. However, he cannot deny, and I think everybody can agree, that what he did helped dramatically change the wrestling business, even if that impact wasn't necessarily felt right away. And it wasn't necessarily a good change. The second individual would be Eric Bischoff. You know, this is a guy that goes back to the days of the AWA when he was an interviewer and announcer for Vern Gagne's territory. So Eric Bischoff put in his time in the wrestling business, no question about it. And when you look at Eric Bischoff, he did some dramatically good things in the 90s with WCW in terms of television production and how things are presented and focusing on, like as he said before, being counterculture to everything that the establishment was. Eric Bischoff was phenomenal, and I emphasize again, phenomenal. At, in that period of time, being hip to what pop culture wanted, being with the times, understanding how to promote his product, get mainstream and new fresh eyeballs on his product. I mean, this is a guy that had Rodman and Malone coming in and doing fucking pay-per-view matches and Jay Leno doing pay-per-view matches. You routinely would have WCW and NWO people appearing on The Tonight Show. They took over The Tonight Show, all this other crap. 
They did so many wonderful things. And for a period of time, the WCW was legitimately kicking the WWF's ass in terms of um, television ratings, no question about it, but just in terms of overall hip and cool factor. People didn't want to acknowledge for a period of time that they watched the WWF or liked the WWF, and a lot of them didn't like the WWF because the WWF still had caught up with the times and realized that it was the time to either shit or get off the pot. And Eric Bischoff did a lot to help spur some major changes. Some of you will say Paul Heyman, and I do not mean to dismiss Paul Heyman at all. But let's face it here, when we talk about apocalyptic things in the wrestling business, you know, Paul Heyman's ECW going away was frankly a drop in the bucket compared to the WCW that Eric Bischoff ran for several years going away. And that's just a fact. Now you look at Bischoff, the way he presented the vignettes of the NWO in black and white and shooting with different angles and so many things. He was really, I felt, ahead of his time from a professional wrestling television production standpoint. And you would even see some of these things play out in TNA. Some of the things they did to make it more reality-based, change the feel, make it feel more organic. It was really, really good. However, Eric Bischoff, for as many great things as he did contribute to the professional wrestling business, also created a lot of problems. The overinflated payroll of WCW, bringing in these old guys to work less dates for more money, and whether they produced or not, didn't really matter. Uh, you know, a lot of big things, and they were starting to make some big mistakes. And, you know, Bischoff was just one small piece, but he was a piece, a catalyst of WCW going under. He might not have been the only reason, he might not have been the biggest reason, but he was definitely a reason for that. And, you know, you look at his time in WWE. You know, he went there for a couple of years, did some good things there, did some bad things. But when you look at TNA, here was a chance for Eric Bischoff to really leave his legacy on the professional wrestling business. Prove that WCW was not a one-time deal. He was not a one-trick pony. But instead, besides some of the production things that changed, Eric Bischoff, to me, did prove that he was a one-trick and one-idea pretty much pony. And... You know, it was very sad to see what TNA used to represent to a lot of fans and see where it sits now and where it sat during the Hogan-Bischoff era. You're just sitting there and saying they're doing everything they can. You almost think that they've been hired by Vince McMahon, Hogan, and Bischoff to come in and run TNA into the ground before it ever would have a chance to really take off. I mean, the decisions that were made under his leadership during his time, I feel, have crippled that company. They've completely crippled them. No more, you know, television tapings in other event or in other venues, excuse me. They're back at the <laughs> at Orlando at Universal Studios. They've reduced the number of regular pay-per-views. So many changes took place under Eric Bischoff's leadership. You know, he's done a lot to help kill TNA. And that has hurt the business today. And he did a lot under his watch in WCW to kill the business back 10 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. No question about it. The next one is Vince Russo. You know, I'm kind of always torn with Vince Russo because on the one hand, I think he doesn't get the credit that maybe he sometimes does deserve for some of his approaches to things and his writing style and how it did help the WWF, you know, turn the corner in the late 90s. There's no question it did. You know, no matter how much propaganda the WWF, like WWE, excuse me, likes to put out there, Vince Russo did have an impact, a big impact on the company, and he did change the company, and he did help change the wrestling business in his own way. There's no question about that. One of Vince Russo's, I think, great legacies as a professional wrestling television writer, book, or whatever you want to call him, but TV writer, was that he made sure as much as possible that everybody that appeared on television had a purpose. Everybody on television had a character. Everybody on television had a reason to be on there, and you had a reason to get invested in them emotionally. I mean, there was a point in time where Crash Holly was incredibly hot. You know, you had the whole hardcore shit and all these other things going on. The bottom line is, you know, stars were all throughout the card of the WWF at that time. So Vince Russo definitely deserves a tremendous amount of credit. And I think maybe because of the arrogance and the egotism right. of the WWE, they don't want to give guys like Vince Russo the credit that I feel they deserve. You could say, well, Vince was at the top. Well, you know what? Before Russo came in there, Vince was still at the top, and you look at like 94 and 95 and 96, how good were those years exactly? My point exactly. But then you look at Russo, his elements of crash TV, of just coming flat out and talking all the time about the professional wrestling business being fake and being bullshit and insulting the wrestling fans and saying, you know, this is not where you need to be. This is where you need to be. And all this dumb, over-the-top, Viagra on a pole bullshit, you know, ended up being too much. It took things too far. It got 
too far away from being professional wrestling. You know, Vince Russo always said that his primary focus, his primary MO was to produce the best television rating he possibly could. And there were periods of time that he did that, even when he was in WCW for that period of time. You know, when he came in that first couple of months, the television ratings were up. But at what cost? At what sacrifice? And it was kind of always that Russo and Bischoff, both of them were very notorious for everything is all about the television, to hell with the pay-per-views, to hell with everything else. We got to go for the ratings every single week now, 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 now. It's all short-term gain, nothing long-term. And then when you look at you know, Russo going to WCW and all the bad things that were done under his leadership during that time in WCW, even in that short time, then all the times he was with TNA and all the stupid shit they did, the electrified cage matches and you know, all this other dumb shit. Remember January 4th, 2010, when they had that abortion of a red steel cage match? I can't even remember what the fuck it was called. You're trying to showcase what TNA can be, and you choose to put that out there. That's Russo. You know, the fans might be stupid sometimes, we might be, but there are other times we're not. And we know when we smell a Russo, because we know when Russo tries to out-Russo Russo with a Russo-type Russo tactic. And when ch fans are chaining fire Russo, fire Russo, that's not good. You know, for all the good things that I think Russo brought in terms of trying to incorporate more work shoots and more reality into the professional wrestling business, to me that fit the times more of the late 90s. In 2013, it doesn't so much. And you still see some of the impact of that in the business today where people are trying to cut work shoots and those work shoots are necessarily classified a lot of times as good promo work when they're not always good promo work. To me, sometimes that's a lazy way to cut a good promo. Anybody can shoot on anybody in a worked or real shoot style. That doesn't mean it's a good promo. It doesn't mean it gets a message across. It doesn't mean it resonates with the audience. And I feel like in a lot of ways where Russo meant some good to the business, I feel like he also undercut and killed a lot of young talent's careers by not featuring them properly and putting them in bullshit and having guys that need to be showcased in nice matches working two-minute shit jobs and all this shit, especially what you saw on TNA over the years. It was terrible. But I think the ultimate horseman of the wrestling apocalypse has to be Vincent K. McMahon, and beyond question. When you talk about the biggest names of the professional wrestling business in its history, Vince McMahon is clearly on that Mount Rushmore. You could make the argument that he is the mountain, but he's definitely on that Mount Rushmore. There is no argument with that. There just can't be. You know, he has, for better or worse, meant so many things to professional wrestling or sports entertainment over the years. And when you look at what Vince McMahon was able to accomplish, he took over for his father's territory or his father and took over that territory pushed his father out of the way, took it over in the early 80s and said, I've got an idea. I can take this national. I can take this international. The old way of doing business, the old territorial system, it's passe. Vince understood what cable television was going to do. He understood that he could become a global entertainment brand. So he was able to sit there and pick off all the top talents by paying them gobs of New York money. He was able to sit there and pick off the top guys from every territory, drive all these territories for the most part out of business, and create a Titan Tower machine. You know, a corporation out of a wrestling company, and that's exactly what he did. You know, he took wrestling, sports entertainment, whatever you want to call it, to unprecedented heights. He absolutely did on more than one occasion. You look at the Hogan era. To this day, people still remember the names of Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man Randy Savage and Andre the Giant and Jake the Snake Roberts and so many others. So many others. And a lot of that has to do with the machine of Vince McMahon and the Titan Tower process. It has to do with how he presented things, how he aggressively competed against everything, how he aggressively tried to get the mainstream eyeballs on his product. And you look again, you know, with the steroid trial, that helped kill the business for a period of time and his companies in particular. But eventually it got to a point in time where he realized he wasn't the best show in town anymore. He couldn't sit there and rest on his laurels. It was time for him to change. And he presented us with the Attitude Era and everything went. And you saw what Vince McMahon could be. He could be the type of guy that could sit there and do whatever it took, any means necessary to win because that was the competitor that was Vince McMahon. He wanted to win, 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 win above anything else at all costs. And you know, at that time, that was a necessary attitude and a function of the system that he was in at the time. He's got WCW breathing down his freaking necks, so looking down at him at the mountain sometimes. So you have to compete in that way. But you also feel like, too, 
that the business at that time with the WWF ended up winning out, WCW is gone. ECW is gone. They did so many things to push the envelope that they probably took pushed the envelope too far. You pop the territory, the territory being planet Earth. And it takes, once you pop it, and you get it hot, and it explodes, after it explodes and the ashes come tumbling down, it takes a long time before you can build up to that explosion again. The longer the boom period, the longer the recession. You see that a lot of times in economics, and that definitely holds true in professional wrestling. When you look at Vince, for all the great and wonderful things I think he has done for the business, the institution of the pay-per-view model and making that a real viable way for a company to survive, you know, being able to make his wrestling, his sports entertainment product a real deal viable form of mainstream entertainment to the point now where he could potentially get a billion dollars a year or more in his company's network television deals in 2014, he could get better than NASCAR money. He could get over a billion dollars a year for all this shit and would deserve it and has a legit claim to do it. If you look at the WWE today, and they're the only show in town, and their mainstream you know, name recognition in terms of their stars, I think, is near an all-time low. Um, overall interest in the product, especially domestically, is definitely not at its highest level it's ever been, nowhere even close. You know, you've got Vince McMahon and the WWE always trying to distance themselves from being a professional wrestling company, trying to always emphasize that they're sports entertainment to the point where it makes you feel like, well, if they're ashamed of being professional wrestlers and being in the professional wrestling business, why shouldn't I be ashamed of being a professional wrestling fan? They've always made it seem like in the WWE that they have to defend what they're doing. They shouldn't have to defend what they're doing because a lot of other forms of entertainment are doing a whole hell of a lot worse than professional wrestling is, believe me, period. And that makes us as fans have to feel like we have to defend it. But, you know, this is the same Vince McMahon that drove the territories out of business. He's the same guy that drove WCW and ECW out of business. He's the same guy that with his... You know, standard that he set, TNA tried to strive to before they were really ready, and it's helped ruin them as a wrestling company. With all the good things that Vince McMahon has represented, he's re represented a tremendous amount of bad as well. And I'm not going to sit there and totally knock on the guy, because if we were in that same situation, in that same scenario, we would have done the same fucking thing. In that type of competition, only one shark's going to survive in the shark tank. You better damn well make sure that you're not the chum that gets eaten up. You're going to be the shark. You're going to go... Arr, arr, arr. And that's exactly what the fuck Vince McMahon did. However, that doesn't mean that Vince McMahon hasn't done a lot to help contribute to the slow, agonizing death, I feel, of what is the professional wrestling business today. It's very hard for people to get into the professional wrestling business and make a good living at it. It's very hard for them to create new stars. It seems like every time you hear about professional wrestling in the mainstream, it's either talking about a wrestler who died a long time ago or it's talking about a wrestler who just died or some other type of stupid controversy. There's nothing good about professional wrestling. Nothing ever talked about good when it comes to professional wrestling. And Vince McMahon has helped create that environment. You know, this is just my opinion. These are four guys that I look like, look at, excuse me, and I feel like they really helped contribute to what is ultimately the wrestling apocalypse, and they have really helped lay the foundation for where the business is today, which is not in a good place. You know, a lot of people can sit there and say, well, this or this or this. No, you know deep well down in the pit of your stomach, even if you're entertained by the product, you know that the business could be a lot better, has been a lot better, and frankly should be a lot better. And I think a lot of times it's Vince McMahon and his position and his arrogance of being able to say, hey, you know, I'm going to end up getting a big-time television deal that might get me over a billion dollars a year for my company. It could be record-breaking. It could be huge. You know, I don't need to do any better. I don't need to take any chances. Well, when you have that type of attitude and you have that type of mindset, you're never going to get any better, and actually slowly you're going to get diminishing returns for playing it safe all the time. So you can let me know down below who you think the four horsemen of the wrestling apocalypse have been. I'm sure there will be varied opinions. This probably wasn't my greatest video of all time, but you get the point. Eddie Mansfield, Vince Russo, Eric Bischoff, Vince McMahon. Four individuals that in most of their cases, except maybe Mansfield, contributed a lot to the business and helped the business and helped the business grow tremendously and get with the times when it really needed to, but also played a big time role in where the wrestling business is today because of the highfalutin shenanigans that they pulled during their times.